Hello and welcome to Dateline Abuja. I am Kayla Magua. We begin the week with a look at the major stories from the nation's seat of power. The Secretary General of the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, Mr. Mohamed Barkindo, is insisting that the worst is over for the global crude oil market. Mr. Barkindo made the declaration after meeting with President Muhammadu Buhari in the State House. We have gone through the worst year in the history of OPEC. In the sixth year history of this organization, we had not witnessed such an oil cycle that we witnessed last year. Uh, therefore, it's uh, incumbent on me uh, to come uh, at this time uh, to brief him on all the efforts that we have made, what we have uh, achieved so far, and uh, our projections going forward. And I will repeat what I had said severally, and that the worst is over uh, for the oil market. We are now on the path of recovery. And thank God uh, you can see the effects uh, in all the benchmarks uh, around the world. The president also met some members of the diplomatic corps. Specifically, President Buhari bade farewell to Ambassador Marcelino Cabana and Sorena of Spain and Ambassador Abdulaziz Mubarak Al Muhanadi of Qatar. Both men are completing their term in Nigeria. Meanwhile, the president has assented to the 982.7 billion Naira 2021 Supplementary Appropriation Bill submitted by the National Assembly in June. The supplementary budget is expected to be used for the provision of military hardware and procurement of some COVID-19 vaccines. The bill targeted the um, provision of infrastructure to all the military formations, i.e. defense, civil defense, army, police, um, and the DSS, all the security outfits in this country will benefit from the bill because of Mr. President's commitment in converting crimes and indeed insurgency and all the security challenges facing the country. So to that end, this bill is very important and it has been assented to. Another critical area of concern is the health uh, sector, which of course we know with the pandemic, there is need to invest uh, in that uh, sector as well. And the president has, uh, having assented to the bill, you'll find that molecular laboratories, about 10 of them, will be established nationwide. And also there are um, oxygen plants that are also going to be established nationwide and some rehabilitated, especially the ones in Abuja, as well as procurement of uh, vaccines, including the J&J &J vaccine which is a one-shot vaccine that had been approved by NAFDAQ earlier in, in, the, in the year. In the meantime, the president left Abuja earlier in the week for the Global Education Summit in the United Kingdom. While in the UK, the president met with Prime Minister Boris Johnson, where the UK pledged to support Nigeria's fight against terrorism. The president also participated in a panel session with other African leaders on funding education, where he pledged to increase the budget of education over the next two years. Nigeria is also expected to get about $120 million from the Global Partnership on Education to be used for developing the sector, especially as it affects the girl child. The federal government is committed to addressing drivers of food insecurity such as inflation, changing consumption patterns, and climate change, despite post-harvest losses in Africa surpassing 20% and prevalence of severe insecurity as high as 22%. These were the words of the Vice President, Professor Yemi Oshimbajo, while delivering his remarks virtually at a preparatory meeting of the United Nations Food Systems Summit 2021. The case for transformative food systems is obvious to us in Africa, especially if we consider that nearly 20% of African people experienced hunger in 2019. And transformative food systems are also essential to feed and nourish growing populations in an environmentally sustainable manner. We must transform food systems to ensure environmentally sustainable production practices. Some agricultural practices have contributed to soil degradation and erosion, and this has, of, of course, affected production. The situation in many African countries is given increased urgency with the impact of COVID-19, uh, which has led to growing levels of acute food insecurity. So it's in this context that the Nigerian government committed to addressing the drivers of food insecurity, 
such as food inflation, changing consumption patterns, and climate change, so climate change amongst other things. At the same time, and as an outcome of about 40 different food systems dialogues, in which up to 5,000 people participated. Nigeria is prioritizing investments in specific innovations and technologies to scale up and transform food systems. The federal government is set to invest $200 million to boost health infrastructure in the country. Speaking at the State House Special Weekly Briefing, the Managing Director of the Nigerian Sovereign Investment Authority, Mr. Uche Oji, notes that major investments in the manufacture of essential drugs, vaccines, and construction of cancer centers in the nation's healthcare will be embarked upon to discontinue huge dependence on foreign logistics. Staff of the presidency are being warned against divulging state secrets as they take the oath of secrecy. The State House Permanent Secretary, Mr. Tijani Umar, issued the warning while administering the oath of secrecy to 42 staff of the State House. We are alarmed by the fact that um, nowadays, uh, due to deployment of staff and to retirement, we discovered that a number of our officers need to be uh, placed under the radar so that they would be aware that the jobs that they are holding and the kind of um, documents or information they are holding from day to day, Monday to Friday and beyond, uh, those documents are so important and must be safeguarded. And the breach of such documents would take away from the delivery of service. And that was the reason why we decided that we should uh, do the needful by administering the oath of secrecy and highlighting the import of letting them know what information they are managing and then the consequences of the breach of such information. The Central Bank of Nigeria says it has ended the sales of Forex to Bureau of the Change operators, saying the parallel market has become a conduit for illicit Forex flows and grafts. The CBN governor, Mr. Govnin Emefiele, made the announcement after the Monetary Policy Committee two-day meeting in Abuja, where the bank retained its benchmark policy rate. Over 5,000 new wigs have been admitted into the legal profession by the body of benches for this year. They were admitted in three batches, while outstanding students from the Nigerian Law School were rewarded. The Supreme Court of Nigeria has dismissed the case brought by the candidate of the People's Democratic Party, Mr. Eitai Ojegede, against the election of Governor Olua Rotimi Akeridolu of Ondo State. The court dismissed the petition with four judges upholding Governor Akeridolu's victory against the dissenting judgment of three other judges. Welcome back. With Abuja being one of the high-risk zones for the Delta variant of COVID-19, how are residents protecting themselves? It's a mix of opinions. However, over 19,000 cases and 169 deaths is cause for great concern. And though COVID fatigue has fully set in, we should be wary of world happenings and use these examples as a cautionary tale. Please watch this. The Presidential Steering Committee on COVID-19 had on July 17, 2021, put five states and the federal capital territory on red alert following the emergence of the Delta variant and a resurgence in the number of cases. A statement by the Presidential Steering Committee listed Lagos, Oyo, Rivers, Kaduna, Plateau and the FCT among the high-risk zones where preventive measures against the third wave need to be scaled up. Since the beginning of the month, the number of COVID-19 cases recorded in Nigeria has been on the rise. Over 1,200 new cases were recorded across the country between May 27 and June 27. But between June 27 and July 27, over 4,200 cases were recorded. As at Wednesday, July 28, 2021, the FCT had recorded over 19,900 cases and 169 deaths. 
Notwithstanding this grim reality, most Abuja residents do not adhere to the COVID-19 safety protocols prescribed by the government. I have not seen someone that may be um, a victim of coronavirus that they will say this, this, this he or she died in coronavirus. I have not seen it in my life. So I, I believe that everything is a scam, sir. So that's I can remember at a particular time, if you go to Use Market, you even see people at the entrance. You are not putting on marks, you are not entering. You don't sanitize your eye, but the pressure, you know, it has gone down to some extent now. So I think the awareness is very low for now. That is why we don't see people adhering to uh, COVID-19 uh, protocol for now. Some even believe that it doesn't exist. That it's just uh, a, a hoax. People brought maybe to use it to uh, make themselves rich and whatever. Why some believe that it's a Western uh, uh, conspiracy against Africa? So it's very, very unfortunate. And I'm telling you that, and some even believe that it has come and gone. And there's no way they can move on, move on with their life. So I think people take it for granted because they don't see it around them, or they've not experienced a family member or somebody they know who died of the disease. But even still, you still need to just be careful and go out with your face mask. But there are few who are not taking chances at all. They comply with the non-pharmaceutical interventions. COVID-19 is real. Uh, we need to take it seriously. Uh, that we are not seeing people our uh, immediate neighbors, relatives that are dying from the disease does not mean that the disease is not there. Probably it's a virus. It's, tr it's trying to adapt to our weather because before it becomes much more virulent to us. So uh, it's something we have to take seriously because already there's already a wrong perception that it's, 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 it's not a disease meant for Africans. So I think that is just it. And then you also see that many government institutions even the churches have also relaxed in terms of enforcement of these uh, uh, COVID, uh, the non-pharmaceutical uh, measures as in cabinet. So I wear it for my safety and I also make sure that um, if you are not putting on face masks, I will not feel comfortable uh, talking or associating with you. The Africa Regional Director for the World Health Organization during a virtual broadcast had warned against complacency as the Delta variant wrecks havoc in the region. Africa's third wave continues its destructive pathway, pushing past yet another grim milestone as the continent's case count tops 6 million. As this surge sweeps across Africa, we're witnessing the brutal cost in lives lost. Deaths have climbed steeply for the past five weeks, jumping 40% in the past week. This is a clear warning our hospitals are at a breaking point. Under-resourced health systems are facing dire shortages of health workers, supplies, equipment, and infrastructure needed to provide care to severely ill COVID-19 patients. The number one priority for African countries is boosting oxygen production so we can give critically ill patients a fighting chance. Effective treatment is the last line of defense against COVID-19, and it must not crumble. As of Thursday, July 29th, Nigeria has over 172,000 cases of the virus with over 5,000 active cases. The country has also recorded over 2,000 fatalities. The emergence of the Delta variant, a resurgence in the number of new cases amidst flagrant disregard for non-pharmaceutical interventions, no doubt call for concern. My guest on the program is Dr. Mohamed Kawu, the Acting Secretary of the FCT Health and Human Services Secretariat. Are there patients with the Delta variant of COVID in the FCT? Are there special isolation centers for them? How do we get more people to embrace the non-pharmaceutical guidelines for COVID-19? And how can these be enforced at the grassroots level? Dr. Kawu, welcome to Dateline Abuja. Thank you. I yeah, want to welcome. Thank you. We've come a long way from when there was no vaccine, when we didn't understand what this disease was. When you yourself was, yeah, you were COVID-19 positive and you came out of it and then you've done the whole advocacy, then the vaccine begins and then now we're dealing with a Delta variant. Exactly how many people 
have this Delta variant in the FCT? I think we need to get things straight. Um, there is no patient that is called Delta variant patient in the FCT right now. Um, what is done usually is those people that came into this country that came down with uh, infection or that tested positive, their blood samples were screened for the serotype. And uh, so far, some of them have been found to have to be the Delta variant. So uh, it's not any time you admit a patient, you say this is Delta variant, no. Um, when you do the PCR, you just know that if it's positive, it's positive for COVID-19. It's only when you go and do serotyping after you are able to say this is this variant or this is that variant. So it's difficult to now say in FCT we have this number of people that are data variant or in Lagos we have these people that are data variant positive. But, but shouldn't we be isolating those that have this variant? Isn't it something we should be focusing on? Anybody that is COVID-19 positive must be isolated. We get that, but, the, whether, but we talk about this Delta variant whether, is the fact that it is a little bit more whether, dangerous than the regular COVID-19 that we've been dealing with. Shouldn't we be looking for people that have the Delta variant and isolating those differently and treating them you differently? See, Killer, that's why I try to explain to you. Serotyping is not like doing PCR tests that you do within 24 hours, 72 hours, 48 hours, you get the result. It's a very tedious and prolonged process. It's only very few laboratories that are able to stereotype. So what NCDC does is to get all the cases that come from outside. When they test positive, we manage them as either Delta variant or COVID-19. We do all the protocols. We lump them together. We, but it's we, a regular, regular COVID-19 protocol. Yes, there is no difference between whether it's Delta variant or non-Delta mm -hmm. variant. When it comes to management, the only difference is this one is more vicious, is deadlier. Are you kidding me? So you treat everyone as dangerous and manage them as such. While the serotyping is done, it's later on that it is, uh, you get the report to say, okay, those samples taken, this number turns out to be, the variant is delta or is alpha or is the other one. Are you kidding me? But when you come to managing COVID-19 cases, whether it's delta, or alpha or whatever, you have the same management protocol. You are more careful when you isolate some delta variants because you know that this variant is a very deadly one. It uh, uh, spreads faster. Is uh, you have more admissions? This VRT. How we get me? Now because of that, Nigerian government through Presidential Steering Committee has put in place protocols. Anybody coming from those red zones countries is quarantined before you even do PCR tests. Even when you come with negative PCR tests, as long as you are coming from these uh, four countries, that is India, uh, South Africa, um, um, Turkey, and Brazil, you are quarantined. Then you do tests at day two and you do this at day seven. Are we getting me? Now, if your day two turns out to be positive, then you are taken for treatment. Or day seven turns out to be positive, you are taken for treatment. And all those samples are further analyzed to find out the kind of, uh, the serotype that is there. So when it comes to management of those cases, it's not immediately you get a positive case, say this delta or this, no. With the talk about the Delta variant, you know, we do have to talk about compliance with these non pharmaceutical guidelines. Uh, it's something that we've been dealing with since before a vaccine came up. Before we talk about vaccine hesitancy, with this Delta variant and with all the education that the, that the public is getting about it, how are you going to be enforcing compliance this time? Yes, thank to you. To the non pharmaceutical guidelines. Thank you very much. I, I think that is the heart of the matter. We have said this not once, not twice. Um, we are human beings, we are not animals. We do risk communication. We use all form of media, be it social, print, or, you know. We inform the society, we go to the communities, we tell them the implication of all these things. 
especially this Delta variant. But, Keller, do you think we have police enough to go around and force people to wear masks? Well, we've had this conversation about, you know, yes. about using law so, enforcement. But, we, but at the time, we said education was key. Has there been enough education for people to be able to buy into this process? Because the last time me and you had a conversation about non-pharmaceutical uh, non guidelines and, and people complying to them, yeah. we talked about the fact that you can't arrest everybody. How do we get people to buy into the importance of the situation? Has that been done? Yes, that's what we've been doing. And this is what we are doing now. Because Delta variant has now come and everybody is agitated. Now there is rekindling and the cases are rising. So we have continued to insist. If you see the guidelines, uh, both PC uh, Presidential Steering Committee and FCT gave during the Salah festivity, is part of the compliance and ensuring that we maintain law and order. We ensure that there is uh, a, a compliance with all these protocols. We restricted uh, uh, the Salah to uh, open spaces. We ensure that uh, none of the um, uh, recreational areas was open for festivities. We ensure that every mugs there must be uh, compliance to the non-pharmaceutical people going to the mugs. What wear about masks. wearing masks in public? When it comes to the Delta variant, we keep telling people, well, because of this variant, still put on your face mask. You still have to, you know, maintain social distancing. You still have to sanitize. You still have to do all of these things. How is that affecting your advocacy towards vaccination? Because for many people, they are saying, well, if I'm, va if I'm getting vaccinated, then am I not supposed to be immune to this disease? Let me just make a correction. And I've always made correction on television like this. What vaccine does is to develop immunity for the person that is vaccinated so that when you get the infection, the immunity you have, the defense mechanism that is built through the vaccination will fight the virus. You won't come down with the disease. You won't be sick. You won't get admitted. You can still get infected. Infected means the virus has entered your body and is fighting with your immunity. Now, if the virus has entered your body and it's fighting with your immunity, so if you sneeze, you can throw the virus out. So you can infect the next person. And that's why, even if you are vaccinated, even if you are fully vaccinated, you must continue to do the non-pharmaceutical preventive measures. And the only time we can stop wearing masks, if we develop herd immunity, it means majority of us have developed uh, immunity, are immune, are protective, protected, sorry. Dr. Kawa, I know we can thank have this you. conversation all day, but thank you very much for being with us on Dateline Abuja. Thank you so much. I appreciate it, honestly. It may be easy to tell people not to enter government buildings or private offices without wearing a mask, asking people to wash their hands in urban centers. But in rural areas, these are luxuries they can't afford. We are even dealing with cholera. Cholera in 2021. I can just see a woman who went to the stream to fetch water for her family, and her child takes the water to wash her hands for 20 seconds, or wearing a mask while doing farm work, or carrying bricks. When you drive around Meitama or Asokoro, you see these old ladies struggling to keep their cloth masks on while sweeping the streets. Yes, there is honor in all labor, but this great divide between the haves and the have-nots must be addressed. And the basic infrastructure Nigerians, regular Nigerians need to survive must be provided. This is half of the work needed to control the spread of COVID-19. That's why we end the show today. Please let us know the happenings in your neighborhood using the social media handle showing right now on your screen. Thank you so much for watching. I am Kayla Megwa. See you next time.